Well, damn. Well, the monkey souls like has finally come out and while the reception seems to be mostly positive, it's funny how so much of the conversation around this game is whether or not it's a souls like, further proof that genre tags are dumb and arbitrary. All I'll say is this, if this game is a souls like, then there's a lot of other action RPGs that we need to consider now. The truth is that this game is doing its own thing. It ain't anything groundbreaking as there's a lot of familiar mechanics here, but I don't even think Game Science was even trying to do anything all that revolutionary. Hell, going from mobile games to this was probably a real learning experience for them. Luckily it paid off for them as 2 million concurrent players on day one is insane. You couldn't ask for a better launch for a nation's first AAA title, but I digress. The real question is if this game is actually worth a damn and not just all hype. For those looking for the quick recommendation, yes, this game is good. Really good, actually. Personally surpassed my expectations and that's because I didn't even think this game was ever going to come out and was low-key vaporware. Also the sinking suspicion that if it did come out, it would be nothing like what was originally shown. Thankfully this isn't a day before situation. Nah, this game is actually as epic as those early trailers shown. <laughs> So obviously this game is based on Journey to the West, but it's only based on it. Don't use this game as a replacement for that book report. Nah, Wukong himself ain't even really in this game like that. Black Myth takes place after the whole journey to the west where Wukong already ascended to Buddhahood. The game opens with Wukong chilling on a mountain only for the whole heavenly court to show up to kill his vibe. The whole beef here is that Wukong doesn't want to live in heaven with these assholes and they don't like that very much. So he gets into a fight with this dude named Erlang who beats him in a duel due to this magical circlet immobilizing him. However, before he gets destroyed, he splits his power into six different relics that are scattered all across China. Fast forward a couple centuries later, and you got a bunch of monkeys near his death site recounting his legend. You play as one of these monkeys called the Destined One, who silently travels the land to find these relics to resurrect Wukong, all while getting pretty damn powerful himself. Reach death and ever grow. Huh? Here, yeah. you see what bliss my face well, shows. Well. <laughs> Luck's around the corner. Seems like he just fell from oh, a fruit yes. tree here. Perfect timing. This peach knew I needed a snack. <laughs> you sneaky rascal! Dad, fool me! I'll make sure you regret it! <laughs> Just when I think I'm getting numb to high fidelity photorealistic graphics, there comes games like this that somehow still impress. Guess I'm just a sucker for that Unreal Engine, but yeah, nah, this game looks nice. The environmental artists were putting in that work because every level in this game is highly detailed, lush, and lifelike. Look at this shot right here. This is the most tame area in the game, and you could just smell the nature. Apparently the devs did a lot of sightseeing around China to accurately portray famous landmarks in the game. Never been to China so a critique from me on whether or not they did a good job ain't worth shit but based on some photos and how these places are presented in game it feels authentic enough for me you knew this game was going to be grandiose off of the opening alone the epic buddhist imagery and scale of things this is some Azura's wrath shit right here only thing that ruins it is the english dub not that it's bad, it's just that this is one of those games where they didn't bother to lip sync for it. So even though the voices are solid, it still feels like one of those janky old school martial art movie dubs. My master, safe. The scriptures, sound. All I ever wanted was a life in my mountain. Free from you and your so-called merits. Despite how over-the-top Chinese mythology can get, this game is mostly pretty chill in its vibe. 
Of course, the boss fights are flashy as hell with crazy anime attacks and orchestral Chinese music blasted in the background, but simply getting through levels in this game is quiet as shit. Only diegetic sounds with very light background tracks that you barely even notice. At least on PC, the game runs smooth enough, but that's only if you install it on SSD. If you install this game on an HDD, man, this shit will be moving like a PowerPoint. The stuttering is real. Don't know why this is the case, but this is a heads up to those that are thinking about copying this on PC. You can see why many chose to say screw it and just get the console versions. But back to the presentation, fancy graphics are one thing. What I wasn't expecting were these chapter and music videos where this game goes full animated movie. Each one brings an entirely new art style to fit the tone of whatever short story that's being told and man, they go surprisingly hard. Some love death and robot shit right here, like you can remove these from the game and they would still hold up on their own. Of course, there's some context to the game's lore that would be lost, but even without the context, these would still hold up as the message and story being told are mostly self-contained. But fuck all that, everyone that's seen this game in passing has nothing negative to say about its presentation. It's the gameplay that's got motherfuckers rubbing their chins. Souls-like or not, the main gameplay loop is pretty similar to those games. You're armed with your trusty power pole and you go through levels bonking enemies in the head. You earn skill points that you put into this skill tree here to unlock new moves. You slowly acquire better armors throughout the journey. You got a healing gourd with limited amount of heals. There's a shitload of tough boss fights and there's incense points that serves as the bonfires in this game. That's kind of where the big similarities end though. It doesn't take too long whacking through enemies in just the first level to notice that this game feels pretty damn different. From jump, the Destin one has this stylish light attack combo that you're going to be dishing out to not just deal out damage, but to build up focus points here so you can deal out harder hitting heavy attacks to stun enemies. There's no block or a regular parry. Instead, you have these sidestep dodges where if you time them correctly, you get a perfect dodge which also contributes to building up focus. With all this in mind, you quickly pick up that the name of the game, especially for many of the bosses, is dodging whatever they throw at you. Get some light attacks in to build up some focus, and then land a heavy attack to stun them. Rinse and repeat with some spell spliced in for some flash, immobilization, shadow clones, transformations, and more. So getting the obvious out the way, yeah, having one light attack combo is whack as shit. Ain't asking for a full combo system via Bayonetta style, but they could have easily had the Destin one cycle through different looking combos while keeping the end attack for consistency. Just visually, it got mad stale looking at this same combo over and over again. However, I don't agree with the criticism that the combat in this game is shallow because of it. Nah, with the three different stances and all the magic you got, there's more than enough ways to lay the beat down in this game and in a pretty badass way too. I love that after effect whenever you dodge enemy attacks perfectly. Getting to a sequence of dodging many enemy attacks in a row feels almost as good as consistently parrying in Sekiro and it flows effortlessly into countering with your staff attacks. Like every good action game, there's an intense back and forth between you and the enemies where they're able to react on the fly with whatever you're dishing out. And the whole thing just looks like an epic shonen battle, which, considering Journey to the West is the godfather to that shit, it's incredibly fitting, ain't it? And yeah, this game is not easy. There were a lot of bosses in this game that gave me more deaths than Kenny in a season of South Park. <laughs> What am I going to do about that? Like, what is that, nigga? Like a lot of people, this asshole was a major roadblock in the beginning, but that's only because he has a lot of moves for such an early boss, and a lot of people at this point don't really know how the game wants them to play yet. I'll tell you which asshole really gave me PTSD despite getting decent eventually. Nope, it wasn't Erlang. He's purposely designed to be an insane secret boss. It was the goddamn Yaksha King. I swear, you can practically hear the developers laughing at you with his bizarrely timed slash attacks. Was really not trying to see more of this shit after Elden Ring's DLC, but unlike Elden Ring, I did find stuff like this to be less frustrating here. And that's because no matter how fast an enemy attack is, you're able to dodge it. Obviously, it's easier said than done, but it's not just you watching the boss do all the cool stuff. There's even a mechanic called see-through where during certain enemy attacks, you can attack an enemy back mid-combo and take no damage if you time it correctly. Probably the most useful skill to master that I could just never get down for the life of me. 
I will admit that this is a skill issue on my part, but the game also does a terrible job at explaining what this even is. They don't emphasize enough how important it is to pull these off because not only can you get some big damage off, but it denies the boss from getting in their bag. Suffice to say, there's a lot more to the combat here than people think, and with this being such a boss focused game, yeah, they're definitely the highlights. There's a lot of A tier fights that I'll be looking forward to whenever I start the new game plus run. Tiger Vanguard, Yaksha King, The Dust Veil, Non Able, Erlang, and The Last Boss. Of course, with the sheer quantity of bosses, not all of them are going to be bangers. And yeah, there are some true stinkers here. Kang Jing Loon, where half the fight is just you chasing the boss. Captain Wise Voice with a terrible camera angle, and Fang Tail General who barely even qualified as a boss. Seriously, what in the fuck was this? Did they really think that holding the trigger button three times and then another context button press that nearly kills you would suffice? The most bullshit part about this is that it's essentially a stat check. If you don't have enough stamina, then you're always going to fall off. If you don't have enough health and miss down on some fire resistant shit, then you're always going to get burned alive here. There's no indicator on what you're doing wrong either, and the fact that this is a main boss too is just horrible. Reflects the quality of the chapter it's in, honestly. Gotten this far in the video and I haven't even talked about the actual levels in this game and that ain't by mistake. Yeah, I don't know how much of a hot take this is, but this game would have been better if it was a pure boss rush. And the reason is because the levels are kind of ass. Not chapter 1, chapter 1 is fine, tightly packed linear levels with few enemies to plow through and bosses not too far along. It's chapter 2 where the level design just goes to hell. Felt like that shit was passed on to a completely different team because it's here where we get these unintuitive labyrinths with invisible walls everywhere and wide open spaces with barely anything in them. Often felt like I was exploring a damn tech demo. Where's the obstacles, puzzles, and traps? Hell, it doesn't even feel like there's enough collectibles. There's so much empty space in this game where it feels like there should be something there, but there ain't. Why couldn't this high ass jump be applied to some platforming? I understand that this is a combat focused game, but even other combat focused games know how to pace things out with other things. Chapter 3 in particular was horrendous. That pagoda shit, it was like, yeah, let's take the Tower of Latria from Demon Souls, remove the tense atmosphere, and litter it with the spongiest enemies ever. And that's not even getting into the game arbitrarily lifting its invisible walls in some parts just to set you back. Chapter 6 was the biggest disappointment. You get a Nimbus Cloud and the game finally opens up to where you can freely fly through this massive space. All excitement dissipates once you realize that this is a massive space of nothing. Other than defeating the necessary bosses, what the fuck are you supposed to do here? Flying around the cloud is only cool for like a minute. It's like most of the development went to the enemy designs because the variety is pretty high. If there is a saving grace is that this game barely repeats regular enemies. Each chapter introduces a handful of new enemies unique to that chapter which did keep things fresh. But yeah, the combat and bosses are what's carrying this, and I kind of wish they stuck to the original vision. But this isn't a pure gameplay first only game we're talking about here, nah. Cutscenes this lengthy were made to be paid attention to when Wukong does have a lengthy story he wants to tell. So I'm just going to be honest, outside of the basic plot of collecting relics to resurrect Wukong, I didn't know what the fuck was going on in this game. Is this how Greek and Norse mythology is for those that aren't familiar with it? Because you have mythical figures popping up left and right with barely any introduction and the game acts like you already know them. It's like watching Dragon Ball Super without watching any of Z. I still enjoyed parts of what was going on here, but I always felt like I was missing a lot of history and context with every character. This is meant to be a sequel to Journey to the West, so I don't fault the game for that. Unfortunately, with this being the case, I can't really offer any substantive analysis of the story and characters. Even after watching multiple plot summaries, I still don't fully understand what's going on. I will tell y'all what I fucked with though. This short story right here between the pig and the woman, yeah, this got some feels out of me, especially with the ultra melodramatic music, yeah, they cooked with this. In fact, they cooked with all of these shorts, but I already gushed about them enough. 
So yeah, that's Black Myth Wukong, the hottest game on the market right now that's still proving that single player games are far from dead. It ain't no masterpiece, and I would even be surprised if it won game of the year, but it's still pretty damn good. Challenging in a fun way, combat super tight, and the game looks great. Apparently there's DLC in the works, which is like the most unsurprising news ever. With a commercial success like this, you gotta keep that gravy train rolling. What I am curious about is what the devs make next. Apparently Black Myth is going to be a whole series where they're going to make more games on Chinese mythology. Hey, if the quality of those is similar to this, then hey, I'm here for it. Anyway, that's all I got to say about this. Do the usual thing to boost this video in the algorithm, and I'll see y'all next time. Oh,